Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the next edition of Clever Conversations. I'm Mike Cavanaugh, um, the founder of Regiment. I'm here today with Larry Berlin. How you doing this morning, Larry? Great, Mike. How you doing this morning? Good. Um, I yeah. hope you're able to uh, grab a coffee. I've got my coffee this morning in my handy dandy work box mug here in River North in beautiful Chicago, Illinois. How about I some of Scully instead? <laughs> That's great. He's That's getting cool. after it. Getting after it at yeah. 8.15. Going to be a long day here. Going to be a long day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thanks for taking the time. You know, clever conversations. I feel like um, every time I sit down and have a conversation with you, I learn something new. Um, so very excited to learn something clever this morning. Um, why don't, um, just for all the people that are tuning in, why don't you give us a little background on on your entrepreneurial journey you know your career so to speak sure it's you know it's funny i'll begin in a funny unusual place back in way in the early 80s here in chicago we had taste of chicago as well as chicago fest and i and my friends had the corn on the cob monopoly at those festivals so we sold hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of ears of corn to hungry chicagoans that's probably where I would begin it. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, that's what I don't know if it mentioned, but thought came to mind. Um, I've spent, I worked for you, I worked on for the Options Exchange, where I was a trader and a member. I then went to UBS, Union Bank of Switzerland, in New York for two years in investment banking. Flipped over to the dot-com world in Chicago, where I worked with um, a friend of mine and a company that was basically designing websites called Ganymede um, for a few years. And then I worked with a company that's doing consulting and data and data flow. Finally, and more important, so Ron Lamore, I spent 20 years approximately. I should say more important, but more relevant, maybe. Um, I spent 20 years with a company called with First Analysis. First Analysis has two, three functions: corporate finance, then investment, and then sell side equity research. And They'll call it private equity, but it's growth capital, whatever you want to call it. We invested in companies in the B round, mostly in the B2B space, not in the consumer space for the most part. And I provided both sell-side equity research, and I worked to help find, invest in, and manage the companies that we were investing in. Most of them were all that successful, unfortunately. I chose financial technology as my area. It's a great area. But I couldn't necessarily convince my partners that those are great deals. We have actually, they still have a couple of the marketing technology deals I did that are still running and doing well. And I've been gone for four years. And then I also end up with the consumer deals because no one else wanted to do them. And <laughs> um, it's sort of the way it goes. It's like when I was at UBS, I did the stuff in China because nobody else wanted to do them because nobody wanted to wake up in the middle of the night, speak with China, but I thought it was fun. Um, and then since then, um, it's been since 2019, I worked with a company called Freedom Fries, where we built a new search engine, and I was the CFO, and it's still there, it's freespoke.com, and hopefully doing well, and then I set up a company, I've done two other things, I didn't make this a short answer, Mike, sorry about that. <laughs> no, 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 it's great. Um, but I've been my, I just finished my seventh year with the New Venture Challenge at the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago, which is more than a mouthful, where for 27 years, we have sponsored student teams who come in, basically learn how to pitch, learn how to build a business plan, learn how to build a business to pursue their entrepreneurial dreams and their careers. I was told that of the 20, it sounds like a lot. But we have 370 companies that still exist, which is a high percentage. Um, I have found what the denominator is there. And <laughs> we have invested or attracted well over a billion dollars of investment into companies that we've helped with. And it's returned over $8 billion to investors. Now, a lot of that comes from a few companies. What a shock. It is venture capital. <laughs> um, Grubhub being one. Braintree Venmo, which is now PayPal being another. Um, we have companies in tech and out of tech from like the world's largest of all things, eyeglass seller in Mexico. It's not the world's largest, it's Mexico's. 
It's got 150 stores in four years. To hot oatmeal, if you want to buy it, to smoothies, to 401k company that helps does technology to allow you to transfer 401ks from, say, Fidelity to Schwab. I don't know if those are customers. That's just an example. Um, so things in all kinds of spaces. And I work with 30 of them a year who come through the program and build businesses. And we're very proud of them. And the last piece in this long-winded answer is Bluepoint Advisory Services, which is basically um, working with startups in a similar capacity to help them build the pitch deck, to help them with the financial to help them with every piece that goes into a fundraise that we can help them with. And I would say the major difference between us and others is that because I'm at the University of Chicago, I ask the questions that help you start a business. And I'm just trying to help someone build a pitch deck. When I say, what's your product market fit? We work on that. When I say, what is your lifetime value to CAC? Customer acquisition cost. We work on that to help it make sense and then analyze it with a, from a net present value perspective. I'm not just putting on words or pictures or some of that on a slide. And that's the big difference for clients, I think. Yeah, no, that's great. And we'll come back to Blue Point. Um, I wanna kind of drill down the next venture challenge, University of Chicago, 370 companies. Um, you know, you work with 30 companies in each challenge. Where do those come? Where do those companies come from? They have to be students. There has to be at least one student on the with a percentage of ownership, and it can't be a small percentage. I don't remember the exact percent, but I think it's over thirty percent. Has to be owned by a student in the business school, and sometimes in an affiliated. We get a lot of plans from the medical school. We get plans from the Institute for Molecular Engineering. We get plans from alumni. In fact, we now have five other, four other tracks for the new venture challenge. I was going to ask that question if it past and present. So anybody that went to booth past and present can apply? Can apply if not into ours. So they have to sign up for the class, be paying for the class, which is, you know, $8,000. Got it. So it's not easy. Are there cheap. scholarships for that? <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll work on that soon. Um but there's university scholarships and scholarships for the business school. And those students can come in. Got and it. you'll get really good ideas. Because we do have a social new venture challenge, a college new venture challenge, an alumni new venture challenge, and a global, which is for our international students. And they all run tracks and they all get investment. This year, we invested about a million and a half dollars in our winners. Um, it's down a little bit because of the economy. Last year and the year before, it was $2 million. But our winning team got almost six hundred thousand dollars of investment, which is pretty good for a bunch of students. <laughs> that was recent, in the last couple of weeks, right? Um, June first or so. So yes. Yeah, and what was the the company that that won the challenge? The company called Alnair, and Alnair is doing something we're all going to hope works very well, um, whether we invest or not. It helps concentrate the treatment of chemotherapy and the usability of chemotherapy but it only affect the cells that have cancer rather than all the cells around it. That eliminates the side effects, the hair loss, the nausea, all the miserable side effects. Hair loss not being miserable, but not being the major side effect, obviously. Um, and it reduces the dosage needed of chemo, so you're poisoning your body less, and it makes it more effective in its treatment. Obviously, the last two go together. And it they're going to FDA right now. Amazing. So as far as the, the, you sign up for the class, the class isn't you up on stage lecturing. Uh, tell us a little about the class. When you told me about it, I'm like, this is great. I wish this existed when I went to college. I probably would have, uh, I probably would have gotten better grades. <laughs> I was a history major. It wouldn't have helped me any. <laughs> <laughs> I had to write papers. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, Steve Kaplan, who's our leader here and the founder of the program and a chaired professor at Central University, he I says it's a class you're going to learn the most and we're going to teach you the least. And I, wanna... he, well, I hear some of... background. If everybody could go on mute. Um, sorry. Keep going, Larry. It's an interesting way to put it. Basically, we select the students going into the year, into January. 
We no introduce the students in February. They have to present twice to us as a group. And outside of the mentors, there's about six of us, the two professors, and we bring in panels of about a dozen venture capital and related judges for each session. They present their business the first time in April. They work with us. We help them with the pitch, with what goes into it, all the things I described that Blue Point does. Plus, we introduce some of the people. I've introduced teams from everybody, from you know the garbage guy in my apartment to the head of navigation for the U.S. Navy. You just never know who they're going to meet and who I know, who the others know that can help. Um, and then they work on the pitch again. They present a second time in May. And then based upon that, we pick 10 teams to go to the finals, which are the first Thursday of June, approximately. And in those finals, we bring in 30 to 35 judges, again, for venture capital and other related fields around the country, who then choose a top, they rank them. And the top one wins the most money down to, we give $10,000 to number 10. And the health with inflation, and well, not inflation, but hopefully with that changes over the years, it gets even bigger. And they, in the process, they'll tell you that it really is a class that they learn the most from. And they won't say it's the least work from us because it is a lot of work. I meet each team two to three times. Each meeting is at least an hour. And when you add that up with 30 teams, it means I'm spending 100 hours plus in 10 weeks with students. And it's phenomenal. Yeah, that's really like hands-on learning, like in the classroom. I love it. Um, I'm going to jump. And I, I feel like um, I was thinking about making T-shirts before this that said, what is your LTV to CAC ratio? Um, how how like often that. do you, how do you drill down on that with the students? Is that, I know, because you really like that ratio. Um, maybe give us a little insight into that. The ratio is very important. What it does is the, the numerator is basically your lifetime value that you expect from a customer. In a recurring business, that's really easy. But let's say I'm going to buy Hostess Twinkies for the next five years because you sold me. At a dollar piece, one a week, I'll make it even. I'll take two weeks off. It's 50 bucks a year times five years. So my lifetime expected value for Hostess is $250. Then you have to say, what's the cost to sell Larry those Twinkies? And if it's going to take four ads on Facebook that are $50 combined, then my LTV to CAC ratio is 5X. Obviously, that changes when you go to something that's B2B and you want to sell me software. And you look at, I'm paying you $1,000 a month in SaaS and $12,000 a year, and the expected value is five years. I have a $60,000 CAC. And if I'm going to have a customer, um, a salesperson work on that for six months to close the deal and then get commission, that could cost me, say, keep the number simple, you know, $12,000. So again, my CAC becomes five to one. But I'm making five times the revenue for every dollar spent. And that's undiscounted into present value. But if you do the math out, that becomes net present value very positive. I want to invest a dollar as an investor into creating that revenue. Yep. And you'll see CACs of up to 10 and 12 and 14 sometimes, as low as three and four. But I want that dollar in. Yep. I want my entrepreneur to be looking at how to best spend that dollar to increase my LTV and lower my CAC, because that's going to give me the highest net present value and the highest exit value as a venture capitalist. Yeah, it's the holy grail, right? <laughs> the holy grail i love it It really is i hadn't thought of it that way until about three years ago and i just started thinking about the ratio and it's now the one ratio i focus on the most and work with people because so much goes into it too and so many processes and procedures go into it and then product market fit goes into the numerator yep well that just made this conversation a lot more clever for sure um a <laughs> golden nugget um Back to Bluepoint. So what was the genesis of, of Bluepoint Advisors? Like what gave you the aha moment there? You know, there, there's been a couple of aha moments and there will be as we expand out because I can see the next where we're going. Um, the first aha moment was that I'm spending so much time 
with companies, and I love it, and with former students, with other companies I meet, basically doing this and helping us. And some of them are very early, and some of them are much later stage over time. And you get, you know, I don't have a public company in my quiver here. Yeah, maybe someday we will, <laughs> because they need it too. Um, we can see that in a couple of blow up. Um, but they need it. And to be honest, we thought we could provide it. I have a business partner, Ariana, and Ariana is a professor of accounting. And we got together and said, why don't we see if we can provide these services? And we have begun to, and we're in the process of expanding. We just signed a couple of contracts, which is wonderful. And yes, the Yahoo, because <laughs> the sales function is one of the most important functions and takes up a good chunk of my day every single day. Um, but you go through it all, and we think we can provide a very valuable service to a lot of people around the country. We're not industry specific. We have everything from higher, from lower tech to, you know, to cosmetics, which is low tech, to higher tech and looking at electronic vehicles and things like that, that we have been working with. And to dot com to actually, as I showed at the beginning, Mezcal. Yes. <laughs> He's not a client, but we're helping him out. And maybe someday soon he will be a client. So um, you never know. Yep. Um, and the idea now is to really grow it. So that A, right. So that Ariana and I are working on it. We do it ourselves. At times we'll use an intern um, when it's necessary, but we want to be the oversight person. We're not passing off the work to someone besides the two of us. And we complement each other and provide, you know, different services in different ways. Yep. And her accounting background is huge. And she also thinks corporate finance. And she also has a great way of asking very good questions, getting right to the point, which is very important when you're building a pitch deck. I'll be blunt on questions sometimes, always with a smile on my face and trying to say it in the right way. And my focus really is the corporate finance aspect and the market aspect of your product and it sounds like a real dynamic duo between you and ariana and um i, so. I want to leave try. enough time for people to ask questions i see some familiar faces here in the audience but um kind of wanted to take an opportunity too to kind of announce the uh what's coming between regiment and blue point advisors um so you get the company ready with their marketing, their valuation, the support. And then if they go to market, Regiment Securities and Blue Point, why don't you share? We, we work together at yes. that point. And I would say we've worked together the whole way in some ways, because when Regiment can provide me with knowledge, expertise, other people to work with, um, I can hopefully provide the same for them, other people to work with, knowledge, expertise, to help the companies get ready. And then once the companies do get ready, we have to open up our Rolodexes in whatever format they're in now. And then we have to help market them, help try and find investors. And then of course it comes up to the company, but we help find investors and work with Regiment very carefully on that. Yep. Would that be how you view it, Mike? Yeah, no, I, and we're in the process of um, getting your series seven registered with, with the broker dealer. And, yep. you know, that's, there's a lot of things we take pride in, but the the one main thing here at Regiment, you know, we have the no a-hole rule and we've <laughs> really built a collaborative culture where professionals that are working with issuers of securities can come um, and do exactly what you just said. Hey, it takes a village to raise capital. And if we can all, you know, help one another out by opening up our networks, once we find um, a project that's worth worthy of investment, um, we we've built that collaborative network. So I'm very excited um, with the, the blue point partnership with regiment securities moving forward. And uh, I'm going to open it up to the audience to see if we have any questions. Anybody have any questions, comments? I see Kurt Conklin in, in the audience. And he, he's got to have a comment. That'll be a loaded comment. <laughs> it, you know, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to set him up. And he's not coming off of me. There he comes. Well, I, I, was, I was muted. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll think about it. But I'm, I'm I'm here I'm here to listen to what Larry has to say. I mean, I haven't I haven't talked to Larry about business in a year or so. So, um, you you throw the questions at him. I well I I will do it. I just wanted to give everybody hello, the Larry. Well, Kurt, great <laughs> to hear you and see you. So, <laughs> for those who don't know, Kurt and I are have been friends for a while. So that was a loaded questioner. <laughs> yep, loaded question comment. So how I'll I'll throw out a question. So start of your career post corn cob monopoly at the taste of chicago um you're an options trader how did trading options transfer the knowledge you learned trading options how did that how did you use that with your shift into investment banking and venture capital what oh. were the parallels but it's actually an interesting thing there's a couple of things that i put in mind first Number one is you learn to analyze the situation around you and sometimes very, very rapidly when you're trading options and you learn to say, oh, I think I'm right. Go with it. But you also learn to say, oh, God, I'm wrong. And switch courses when the evidence in front of you in the case of an options trader, it's the stock market going down when you just bought or up when you just sold. But you figure it out really quickly. You move on quickly and you move to the next item. It also teaches you a whole other aspect of human re relations because you're in a pit where people don't necessarily want you to be with them. And you have to get along with them, work with them all day. Um, and you, we did well. People on the floor do very well at that. I would add a third thing. You have to learn trust and you have to learn the importance of honor because everything on the floor is done by verbal. Nothing is done by written contract. At least at first. And yeah, our, our, our word yeah, is our bond. Our word is our bond. Our word is your bond. Yeah. And that's the way you approach life. That's the way I approach life. And the world, word is my bond. Word is my friend's bond. And I trust them to do it and the people I'm doing business with. That's the most important, one of the most important lessons you can learn. Yep. Um, here's a good one. Bennett, um, who's with Regiment, he's our marketing guy. Um Hi, it says, Larry, can you talk about how bear markets or recessionary environments are good for innovation and entrepreneurship? Yes, I can. Um, first of all, someone who is, say, a recession, somebody who is unemployed is looking for new things to do. And American market and American people and world, but the U.S. really, is very creative. And the need is a mother of invention in a lot of cases. And when you get into those, when we get into a tougher time at work, tougher times to find work, people actually start creating and being creative. I would add that in a bear market also, valuations of companies do come down. Um, that hurts in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways, it gives people who are investors, it's free market. They're, they're attracted by the lower valuation. They come in with their money. The odds are in a venture fund, they have a six-year investment period. Right now, we're dealing with funds that started raising money in 19, 18, 20, and they have money to invest. And even if we're in a recession right now, this money's there. They see the valuations, and they come in much bigger, planning for when the economy and the market comes back together. So it helps both sides, Bennett. And in the end, it hurts while obviously while we're in it, it hurts people. But as we come out of it, we build in that for the yep. future. And where do you think we are right now? Are we in a recession or? It's really hard to tell. It's one of the weirdest. I think we probably had about seven recessions in my lifetime. And this is probably the weirdest one of all of them. Um, because you have the post-COVID effect. We had the savings overhang from COVID, which helped fuel economic growth the last couple of years. We have had a labor market weirdness, is for lack of a better term, but the labor market has been full. We're near full employment, except for maybe in the Google world, but I suspect those people are getting employed and getting jobs pretty rapidly too, maybe at lower salaries. So the normal things to expect, high unemployment, and lower spending by the consumer just haven't been happening. Investment's been all over the map from corporations though. And that's one of the major determinants that people forget about that. 
Because if I invest a dollar in Amazon in 1995, not only is that probably worth $1,000 now, but also created 1,000 jobs. My going and buying my Twinkies doesn't create jobs in the same way. It creates a fraction of one job. So investment's very, very important. And people do not think about that. The news doesn't think about that. But that's been all over the map. And I think we're seeing people, though, who are investing. And if we do hit a recession, unemployment or inflation was down a bit this week. Maybe the, the Fed didn't raise interest rates yesterday. Maybe that means that we're near the end of it. And then maybe we can have inflation back to that 2% level and see, you know, 2 3 4% growth in the economy. Not this year, but next year, year after. So yeah. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. And I was scared de to death during COVID of what was going to happen. I thought we had pro a big issue that we hadn't thought about, which is throwing too much money into the economy. Yeah. And we did. It, but it's hopefully it'll be better than I thought. It's definitely, um, there's no historical data points to look back to, to say what happened the last time, you know, we came out of a global pandemic and, you know, there was inflationary pressures and a world war about to break out, blah, 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 <laughs> like everything. There's no data points. Um, exactly. The books by the members of the Fed today will be interesting. Um, in 2007, 2008, Randy Krosner at the University of Chicago was on the Fed. And I believe he's written about it and the experience of dealing with that crisis. And I have not had a chance to sit down with him. I need to call him and hear what he thinks about this one. <laughs> Maybe we can have, you, have you bring him on Clever Conversations and we can fireside chat him. <laughs> I will ask him. I will ask him. He's a great yeah. guy, a smart person, and he has experience. And he's a professor at my favorite university. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, Larry, we're buttoning up on time here. Thank you so much for coming on this morning. We're super excited um, to forge forward with the partnership between Regiment Securities and Blue Point. And uh, thanks for making this morning clever. It's a great way to start the day. And we'll see you soon. Thanks, Have a Larry. great day, everyone. Yep. Thanks, everyone.